Hi everyone, welcome to the keynote speech for PyeongChang Peace Forum 2021. My name is Moon Sori, the moderator for this session. This session will be on inclusive cooperation for peace in the post-COVID-19 era. And I think it will be the opportunity to hear the various opinions of the way how to establish the universal peace as the sports and the social businesses invited to honor the Nobel Peace Laureate. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let us introduce the Executive Director David Beasley, United Nations World Food Program, and the Executive Advisor of Geneva Institute for Leadership and the Executive Advisor, Geneva Institute for Leadership and Public Policy, Arthur Lindsley, for the first session. Well, David, thank you for being willing to share with us today. Let me give a quick introduction as to who David is. David's former governor of South Carolina and now executive director for the United Nations World Food Program. Under David's leadership, the World Food Program has just won the Nobel Peace Prize. The World Food Program is the largest uh, humanitarian organization in the world, and I understand its budget uh, has been about was it 18 or, or 8.4 billion dollars a year now. Uh, under David's leadership, it's increased that much. David's also a valued friend to Connie and I. Uh, so thank you for being on with us, David, and for giving us your very valuable time. Art, it's great to see you. It really is. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Uh, you bet. It's uh, great to be able to talk to you. Uh, when we had lunch back last April, uh, you talked to us about uh, COVID shutdowns and how it hurt the world's economy, <laughs> leading to increased world hunger. What's the situation now? How many people are on the brink of starvation? Talk to, the, uh, to us about that a little bit. You know, when COVID was just coming on the scene uh, back in early part of the year of 2020, I got a phone call from an old friend, Tony Blair from the UK. And, and Tony said, he said, David, you, you travel around the world probably more than anybody and see a comprehensive picture. What do you think? And I said, Tony, what I'm very concerned about is everyone at that time was making decisions, uh, healthcare decisions about COVID in a vacuum, not really appreciating the consequential dynamics. And I said, we've got to be careful if we're not the cure will be worse than the disease. We'll end up killing more people from starvation by economic deterioration. So we really have to work a hunger pandemic along with at the same time with a COVID pandemic. And the world responded and we've really dramatically changed the dynamics of how we, we were working out in the field, so to speak. Now, that was back in March and April. And I spoke to the United Nations Security Council saying that we've really got to be strategic in how we approach uh, these issues around the world. Now, before COVID hit, because of man-made conflict, the hunger rate, I'm talking about the severe hunger rate, those people that are marching towards starvation. The general hunger rate is about 700 million. But those that are marching towards starvation was 80 million when I arrived at the World Food Program four years ago. Prior to COVID hit, hitting, the number had gone from 80 to 135 million driven primarily by man-made conflict, coupled with climate extremes and fragile governance. But since COVID, the number has spiked. And I'm not talking about people going to bed hungry. I'm talking about people that are really don't know where the next meal is and they're marching towards starvation. That number has now gone from 135 million to 270 million people wow. around the world. And we're looking at 36 countries that could potentially have famine this 2021 if we don't get the access and the funds that we need. So it is a very bad situation, Art. And if we don't get the monies we need, we will have mass starvation, destabilization of nations, and mass migration from those nations. So it's a lot cheaper to address the problem early on than wait after the fact. One of the things you mentioned there, too, is the number of people that are dying per day of hunger. Uh, do you know what that is and how that's increased? Well, just to give you an idea, about 9 million people died in the, in the world in 2020. Uh, about a million and eight or 900,000 died from COVID. And so it's not one versus the other. It just shows you how bad both are. So you do the math uh, and you're talking about every so many seconds. 
a uh, person dies on earth from hunger. And you know, the, the, the shame about that is that there's so much wealth in the world today. There's $400 trillion worth of wealth in the world today. Not a single child uh, or person should die from hunger. Uh, we have a cure for hunger. We have a vaccine against starvation. It's called food. And so we just need people to step up and do what we can to bring some comfort and hope to people around the world, Art. Well, thank you for that. Uh, uh, you've talked a lot too about the relationship between hunger and conflict. Can you unpack that a little bit and tell us what you mean by that? Well, I could probably talk about that all day long and I can assure you that the people of South Korea know exactly what I'm talking about. And just a generation back, people were starving, struggling, and there's a clear con uh, connection between conflict uh, and hunger between security, peace, and hunger. In fact, uh, we were able to get the United Nations Security Council to pass a resolution last year. Uh, the Security Council, which many times is divided with Russia, China, and the West, actually came together on this very important issue, saying there's a clear connection between food security and peace and stability. In fact, that was one of the, the strong and clear messages that came from the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, because they clearly recognized that the work that the United Nations World Food Program was doing out the field was bringing peace and stability, using food as a weapon of peace, when some try to use it as a weapon of war, or like extremist groups will use it as a weapon of recruitment by denying food. And so what we have learned uh, over the years, and we survey a lot of people, as you can imagine, we, we are feeding about 100 million people right now as we speak on any given day, week, or month. And we we're trying to move those numbers up quite substantially this year because of COVID. But for every 1% increase in hunger, there's a 2% increase in migration. And when you have spike in prices, you'll start seeing destabilization and riots and protests. So it's all interconnected. And so, Art, uh, we know uh, what needs to be done. We just need the political fortitude and the will to get the money to get the food in the places that need it most. I, I really like that phrase, uh, weapon of food is weapon of peace uh, that you used. I know we're, we're at the Pyeongchang uh, Peace Forum 2021. And just can you unpack a little bit more, maybe an illustration of food as a weapon of peace? Well, in many places, for example, I was when the day that I received the phone call from the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, I was in Niger and I was out in the field negotiating access in an area where you had ISIS to the south and Al Qaeda to the north, for example. And if extremist groups can deny access to food, then when a mother or father hasn't fed their child in a week or two weeks, they have to join uh the extremist groups and so we were out in the field negotiating access so that we could get food to people that would not have to join the extremist groups because then when they're as food is not available they they grow their numbers in terms of the militants and extremists now in general areas and we can show this from place to place to place uh because we're in about 83 countries are uh, 80 percent of our our expenditures are in conflict areas about 60 percent of the people and we see a direct connection and correlation between food and peace and whether it's in the isis or al-qaeda or boko haram or al-shabaab area or it could be in south sudan or syria uh and many other places that we're in as we speak and some entities will use food as a weapon of division, a weapon of war, a weapon of recruitment, violating your fundamental human rights. And so when we're there, and I can I tell you, I, I can give you anecdotal evidence, and particularly in the Sahel, when we're there with food programs and school meals programs, mass migration drops off the chart, teen pregnancy and 12 year old marriage rates drops off the chart, recruitment by ISIS or Al Qaeda drops off the chart, it's a lot cheaper for everybody to address it on the front end versus having destabilization and migration. And, uh, and we've got a lot of statistical analysis because of the way we survey people 
when they don't have food, what happens? And there's a clear, absolute correlation. You can imagine in your neighborhood, if, if everybody in your neighborhood didn't have food, what do you think would happen? And you couldn't get to a store to get food. And, and if one house in the neighborhood had food, what do you think is going to happen? And we're dealing with that right now in Yemen. If Yemen ends up because of the designation of terrorist organization, and if we can't get food into Yemen, which, re, which requires over 90% of all the food that goes, uh, that the people consume in Yemen comes from the outside. So if we can't get food in, imagine if I do have one truck going through a neighborhood and nobody in that neighborhood has had food in two weeks. What do you think is going to happen to my truck and my truck driver? It's yeah. not going to be a good scene. It's just common sense. And who would have ever thought in 2021 we'd be dealing with issues like this with all the technology and all the wealth? All right, it's a shame on us. But South Korea has shown, has showed the, the way forward with this past, its history, and how to go from a recipient nation to a donor nation. What a story that you have right uh, where we're talking about at this conference today. Yeah. yeah, tell us a little bit more about South Korea's involvement. Do you have any more specifics about it? Yeah, I mean, South Korea has been a great partner. I travel there quite often. And uh, out of all the countries on earth, South Korea is in the top 10, top 11 donors around the world. And what's good about that is you can imagine uh, it was only a matter of one, two generations ago that South Korea was a recipient nation receiving support from the World Food Program, a nation that literally was on its knees. But now it's a nation that has rebuilt, retooled, and is giving back all over the world. And I love meeting with the leaders because they love the World Food Program. They said, you were there when we needed help, and we're there when you need help. And so now we receive literally over a hundred million dollars from the people of South Korea because of their understanding the importance of this wow. issue and what it means to their livelihood, what it means to their children and to a better future. Can, can people give like in South Korea and other places give money to the world food program in order to give to North Korea? And what is the situation there? But kind of both questions together there. Yeah. Um, the situation is that people can give to us. Uh, we have an office in Seoul, uh, so don't hesitate to contact our team there, uh, the United Nations World Food Program. Please uh, call them, go see them. They would love your engagement, love your support. You can also go online, uh, and share the meal .org, uh, and, and donate, donate directly. You can go to www at our World Food Program website, look that up, donate that way. Governments obviously are critical to our support. That's where we get most of our money, but also the private sector, but not just North Korea. We receive, you know, as you can imagine, eight four eight point four billion billion, a lot of money all over the world. So we're raising money all the time and we are a very efficient, effective operation. And so the people of South Korea have been tremendous donors uh, to help people around the world, but also into DPRK. And uh, I was there not too long ago, but because of COVID, it's, a, it's pretty much locked down right now. And so I can't give you uh, experiential up-to-date data. Uh, I have a team on the ground there, but restricted movement. I hope to be back in DPRK very soon uh, in the next month or so as things lighten with regards to COVID because we have uh, a, a lot of concerns. Uh, around the world in North Korea, DPRK. Uh, we hope to help the children that we have many, many years. We've been there, Art, for about 25 years, and we've got the biggest, largest footprint on the ground. And uh, I've met with the leaders on a number of occasions, having very practical discussions, very frank discussions. Uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, we can be back in operator, operating capacity like we were before once things open back up. And I hope that sooner then later. Yes. Well, uh, the Pyeongchang Peace Forum uh, 2021 is, of course, focuses on peace and reconciliation around the world, and particularly uh, with North Korea. But how can this forum really help to contribute to peace uh, from the World Food Program perspective? Well, Art, peace is a very elusive thing. You don't appreciate it till you don't have it. 
right. you know. And when you think about how much peace has been brought and prosperity uh, around the world, no, you know, not many people realize uh, that 200 years ago, 95% of the people on earth were in extreme poverty, extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. Today, less than 10. So I tell a lot of the young people, be careful. Don't tear down the systems that's helping 90% sharing more wealth than any time in world history to help the 10%. What we can't do is neglect that 10%. We need to improve the systems, tweak the systems, enhance the system, and reach that final 10% out there because they are not experiencing this better way of life. And so peace is critical. If people don't have food, don't have some degree of, of economic and food stability, you will have conflict. You will not have peace. You will have war. And when you look around the world today, uh, it's heartbreaking, Art, to see what's happening. In fact, the United Nations, uh, and particularly with leadership like Ban Ki-moon, had, had established sustainable development goals for the whole world. One of them was to end world hunger by 2030. And quite frankly, that's doable. $400 trillion of wealth in the world today with our experience and expertise, but man-made conflict is driving the hunger rate back up when we should be eliminated by eliminating hunger my goal when i arrived at the world food program was to put the world food program out of business <laughs> because people would no longer need our outside support you know i have not yet met a mother out in the field whether it's uh, a war zone or or like Niger or, or Burkina Faso, I've not met one yet that wanted outside support. They want to take care of their own families. And when we come in and help them and strengthen them, I've had more mothers tell me, Mr. Beasley, I'm no longer taking care of my own family. I'm now helping my whole village. And if I could just grow another acre, I'm gonna sell into the marketplace. And that's that entrepreneurial spirit of taking care of your village helping your neighbor and into the marketplace. And so that's where we want to be. And peace is critical to that. And it's why we need to build systems with our beneficiaries. We are rehabilitating land, putting in water systems to improve the quality of the community so they can be stabilized and have peace and not be vulnerable to extremist groups and extreme politics. Uh, well, uh, governor Moonson Choi, who's the governor of Gangwon province that is hosting this conference, really has a passion for this idea of peace and reconciliation, particularly with uh, North Korea. Is there any way that we can uh, establish a partnership between Gangwon province and uh, the World Food Program, or how would we go about doing that? Well, I would certainly hope so. And of course, we all know the sensitivity of the politics uh, with regards uh, to this particular area of the world. And so we are definitely open to ideas and thoughts and would be willing to sit down and discuss ideas. Uh, it's, you know, we're hopeful with all the troubles around the world that we would love to see uh, the peninsula become a bright spot for the whole world and, and see these differences come to an end, Art. I know everybody uh, where you are, I mean, where this conference is and the governor are thinking the same thing. So. Anything we can do, any ideas you have, yeah, you know, we look forward to talking about them. Well, I would certainly want to talk to you for a long time, but I know you're very busy. And thank you so much for being willing to give us your time and this report uh, for the Pyeongchang Peace Forum. So uh, thank you so much, and uh, we'll let you go. Congratulations on the Nobel Peace Prize, and thank you for all the tremendous work you're doing. All right, thank you. It's great to be with all of you and uh, blessings to you all. And let's build a, a safer, better, and, uh, and, and a good world. We got a lot of work to do this year. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the Executive Director Feasley and the Executive Advisor Linsley for your outstanding conversation. So now we'd like to move to the special speech by the co founder of Unisports Hub and the Nobel Peace Laureate in 2016, Muhammad Yunus. Let us enjoy it. Hello, I'm very happy to be with you today. I want to begin by thanking uh, the government of Korea and uh, Gangwon provincial government 
along with the city government of Pyeongchang. And of course, Pyeongchang Legacy Foundation. Today, I uh, remember the day I was in Pyeongchang in 2018 to watch the Winter Olympics. That was a fantastic experience for me. I'll never forget that. The setting and the enthusiasm and the warmth of the people, you're surrounded by it. And it was a great event. The whole world watched that event, the Winter Olympic 2018 in Pyeongchang. But what makes it historically unforgettable is something else. It will be remembered in history after so many years, something happened, what the people of the world was wishing to happen, but never happened before. Winter Olympic 2018 made it happen. That was the most fantastic thing that goes with the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic. When the North Korean athletes marched into the stadium, together with the South Korean athletes under a common flag. It was an unbelievable sight for everybody who was present there. And I'm lucky to be one who watched that. I'll never forget in my life what I saw. And that has engraved in the minds of everybody's mind around the world. And very reasonably, in order to continue the legacy of that peace, a legacy foundation was created in continuation of that peace building. Pyeongchang Legacy Foundation was a kind of ex expression of the common desire, common wish of the citizens of the world. So I'm very happy to be associated with the foundation. And I'm very happy that the Pyeongchang Legacy Foundation created this event, Pyeongchang Legacy Forum, every year to remember what, what happened in Pyeongchang in 2018. And I feel very privileged to be associated with the foundation and with the forum to carry the flag of peace. And legitimately, rightfully, that become the message of the Pyeongchang, path to peace. And that continued in organizing things, building the facilities built by the Olympic to make it uh, available for building further peace. And that idea of permanent peace never to be forgotten. And trying to, we all combine our strength to make that happen as we go along. I created a forum myself called UNOS Sports Hub. This is an institution dedicated to bring the sports people and the sports admirers, supporters put together to use the power sports generates in dedicating that power in solving the global problems. And I always have been uh, uh, I emphasizing that the sports is the greatest power that you can see. It's amazing power. It touches everybody, no matter who you are, where you are, whether you are young, whether you are old, whether you are the richest person, whether you are the poorest person, whether you are in the remotest person, whether you're in the metropolitan area, it doesn't matter. Everybody enjoys sports, athletics. And they devote their time and enthusiasm behind it. And the whole world get glued to the television sets when an event like Pyeongchang Winter Olympic takes place and other Olympics take place. They enjoy it so much, those moments are preserved with the enjoyment and the happiness and the thrill of seeing one delegate 
competing with another delegate, one team competing with another team. We don't know the names of those countries. We don't know the identity of these people. But we became one with them. We feel excited about the victories they've earned. And you feel sad when you miss it. And we cannot get away from it. And my point is all this power of sports and athletics used up in uh, commercial purposes to sell things, to draw attention to a particular product. And it becomes commercial. Sports become commercial, clubs become commercial. That's good. I'm not complaining about it. But my complaint is another dimension of that power, which we do not use at all. It remains totally unused. I'm challenging everybody to use that, to use the power of sports, power of athletics, to change the world, change the life of the people. Because we have that power. We demonstrate it, but we don't use it for another purpose. So I'm opening the door. The, the power was there, but the door was closed. So I'm opening the door so that that power, power of unity, like it was demonstrated in Olympic, Winter Olympic 2018, what the power was, which was not done by the United Nations, which was not done by any diplomatic exercises, was done by sports and athletics. That's the power. But that was a one-time demonstration. I said it could be done every day. That's where the legacy foundation's work and our work can combine forces to make it happen. And we created this UNICEF Sports Hub for that intention, how to attract the power of sports in solving the problem of poverty, solving the problem of water, problem the, solving the problem of environment, and all the problems that we have accumulated over the years. And we can participate in it, make it happen because we feel strongly about doing that thing. But there's no forum for us. So I hope we can build that forum together with the Legacy Forum, with the Legacy Foundation of Pyeongchang, and with, along with our initiatives combined forces, to combine forces with the Foundation to make things emerge from this collaboration. And we have so many action points to make it happen. I'm very happy that the city government is supporting us. I'm very happy that this provincial government is supporting us. And I'm very happy that the Korean New Deal happen, will support us. This goes very closely with each other. And that is the most exciting point about it. Because I like that idea. I like that idea about the uh, uh, New Deal. This focuses on uh, a digital New Deal the Green New Deal, and about the Social New Deal. You'll see tremendous amount of overlap between what we are saying, what the New Deal is trying to approach. We talk about three zeros. And the three zeros in social business that we work with, we say we want to build a new world, world of three zeros. Zero net carbon emission. We don't want to see this uh, threat to global warming created by the global warming. And that's number one zero, zero net carbon emission. And the second zero, zero wealth concentration. Wealth is concentrated in few hands. Today, it's a very ugly situation right now we are going through. All the wealth of the world is concentrated out there in the sky, in the hands of few people. 99% of the wealth of the world is concentrated in the hands of 1% of the population. 99% of the population of the world has only 1% of the wealth. And all the people are concentrated in the bottom, bottom of the income level, earning $5.50. $5.50 a day are the people who are half the population of the world. Half the population of the world is under $5.50 per day. 
And then after that half the population, you have it packed in the bottom. Then you have $10 a day, $20 a day, $100 a day. They talk, take care of 90% of the population. So the 90% of the population are all in the bottom level of our existence. But then you have the million dollar a day. They are way above. There are only very few, very minuscule, 1% of the people. They have the 99% of the wealth. If you're looking for the wealth, you don't see the wealth at this bottom level. Wealth doesn't exist here. All the wealth is up in the sky. So you have a big difference between the wealth on one side and the people on the other side. That's not a very peaceful world. So that's why in order to bring peace, I think we have to work on this issue. Because it, poverty is a threat to peace. You cannot solve the poverty level, poverty problem unless you address the issue of wealth concentration. So we are looking for zero wealth concentration, zero net carbon emission, zero wealth concentration, and zero unemployment. These are the three zeros that we work with. And these are like uh, three uh, deals, digital new deals, green new deals, and social new deals. When you address the social new deals, you'll be addressing these problems of peace in the society so that you have, you have a system of sharing wealth rather than concentrating wealth, taking away wealth. That's not the good system to work with. So we have lots of commonalities within us. We'd be very happy to uh, work with the uh, Korean government to talk about uh, what we do, how we do it, how it will be relevant for your uh, new deals and uh, where it can be applied. So this is how uh, step by step we address the issues and we want to bring the force of sports into it to build peace. Because if you, if you want to build peace, it has to be done step by step from the bottom. That's what we are looking forward to. My journey began in the same way, uh, in a situation where I was extremely frustrated. Uh, you know that I got involved and started the what now known as microcredit. It's not, it didn't come from some kind of research that I was doing at the university. Yes, I was teaching at the university. I was enjoying my teaching, teaching economics in the university as a young teacher. But unfortunately, the country, uh, Bangladesh, was going through a terrible situation at that time when I became a teacher in Bangladesh. I used to teach in the USA, but uh, then I came back in 1972. Uh, to see if I can be uh, associated with the process of uh, changes in Bangladesh. And what frustrated me, instead of improving the situation of Bangladesh, it continued to become worse and worse. And in 1974, we had a terrible nationwide famine. People were dying everywhere because they cannot eat enough. And that's not a very nice experience for a young teacher teaching economics to see you teach elegant theories of economics in the classroom, and then you walk out, see that people are dying. And you see, feel it's, it's a mockery that uh, you go through. You talk about beautiful things, but then you, your theory doesn't work outside your classroom. So I felt very disenchanted, very frustrated, very angry that I have learned something which doesn't help me do things that way I want to do. So I was trying to see if I can make myself useful in some way to the relevant people, people that I meet, people that I see in front of me. So one idea I have, why don't I go to the people who are just there outside the campus? And that campus is surrounded by thousand year old villages all around it. So I can go there and see how people live rather than talk about uh, people inside the classroom without ever knowing who they are. So I started doing that. And the purpose is to how to make myself useful to at least few people, one, two, three, four people. I'm not ambitious. I'm not trying to change the village or anything. I thought economics never gave me any tools to do anything of that kind. So I wanted to see, discover my own work, more usefulness by doing little things for people. They may need, they may be needing these little things. In the process, I discovered Another terrible problem, one after another, this is a loan shark. Loan sharks lend little money to poor people and grab everything they got. And it was terrible. People who are victimized by that, 
so helpless. And I talk to them because I go to village every day, talk to people every day. So I keep hearing these uh, stories from people that I meet, how they became victimized, they lost everything, they got and got worse and worse. And I also meet the people who are lending the money, the loan sharks. They think, oh, they are doing a good thing for people because uh, they needed the money and he got the money. But I wanted to see how I can protect the people who are being victimized. So one idea that came to my mind, why don't I lend the money myself? If I lend the money to the person who needs the money, then his problem will be solved. He doesn't have to go to the loan shop. And I kept, I protected the person just by lending the money. It doesn't need a theory or anything, just a common sense. And I applied that common sense. I started giving money. People were, people were very happy that they, I could give them the money and they could get the money from me. And the idea spread and many people, many more people kept coming. And gradually it became, whole village got into it. And I saw that as, as it grows, I cannot handle it just by myself. I brought my students to help me as volunteers. So they were helping me. But then I thought I should make it a formal institution, a bank. So my journey began to how to create it in the bank. It's a long journey. But in 1983, finally, we got the permission from the central bank, from the finance ministry to become the bank. And we came, became a bank called Grameen Bank or Village Bank. And the idea of lending money to poor people was described as microcredit. We tried to explain what we do is a non-collateral banking. You don't ask for any collateral. You don't ask for any property. You don't ask for any identification or a, uh, kind of someone who stands for you as a guarantor. We didn't ask her anything, just on faith or on trust, giving them money. And it became very popular. And soon it became nationwide. The idea of microcredit is spread all over the world, that there's another kind of banking without collateral, which can lend money to the poor people. And it spread even to Korea. So I was very happy that people liked that idea and so on. Along the way, what we are doing, we saw the problems of the poor people in the villages, not only about the loan shark, also about health, about housing, about sanitation. So I started addressing one after another. I created a business to produce toilet in the village so that we can give loans to the poor people. They can buy the toilet and set it up and pay the toilet loan over a long period so that it doesn't weigh heavy on them. Just a tiny, tiny money. You don't even notice how much you're paying. And over time you pay back the entire money for the toilet that you paid for. And in the meantime, you have a toilet in your home and you are, you are avoiding getting connected with the diseases because when you, have, you don't have toilet, you will spread diseases not only for your family, for the rest of the village also. So I was trying to do that. And the toilet became a very popular subject, not only from the Grameen borrowers, also non-Grameen people. They were well-off people. They didn't have any toilet either. So this is what one after another. And I brought the healthcare program, in introduced the healthcare insurance program so that I can provide healthcare to all, everybody in the village through the healthcare insurance. And brought uh, solar energy in the village started selling solar home system. It's very small price. We said you just pay the money that you spend on kerosene for the next three months, uh, sorry, next three years. And you have your uh, solar home system paid for. You don't have to pay anything extra. Just pay the money that you spend for your kerosene. That's all every month. And you do this for three, three years. We are fun. You are, everything is yours. You don't have to pay a penny. You don't have to spend any money for anything. No other kerosene, no solar energy, nothing. That's it. They loved it. So it's spread all over the country. Our solar energy company became very popular. So we brought many other environmental things like uh, the biodigester. There's a lot of cattle, a lot of uh, uh, possibilities of building bio, biodigesters. Uh, so we did that. So we spread one after another. We created company after company to make sure we can address the people's health, people's uh, um, sanitation, and so on and so forth. 
So that gave us the idea that business can be done in a different way. In all these businesses, there was no intention at any point to make money for myself or anybody who is running this. That was completely remote. All we wanted to do, whatever it cost, you pay me that money so that I can produce more. And I can grow because of that. And that's how it was. Then I saw this is a complete, when I got into debate about what kind of business is that, if you're not making money, I keep asking people, is there anything wrong with the, like, doing business without making money? Is the government going to uh, take me to jail for that? I said, this is my desire. This is my wish. That's what I do. it, And I enjoy it. It's a fun to do that, to, stay, to be able to solve people's problems. That was the genesis of what we now call social business. Non-dividend company to solve human problems. That's what we have been doing. And it is spread all over the world now in, and came to sports. So sports is a big power, as I was explaining to you. And sports people getting into social businesses and see, build their own future. At the same time, building, solving problems for other people. And that's what it is. So this is, once you solve problems, people, frustrations are overcome. People's problems were, were, are overcome. Then it becomes a more a world of peace rather than a world which is, has a tension, creates violence, and so on and so forth. So this is the direction I've been going through. I'm very happy that the Olympic people uh, took social business seriously. Uh, International Olympic Committee is very serious about uh, our work how to collaborate with us. And now we'd like to see how we can work together with the foundation, with the Legacy Foundation. Uh, Olympic uh, 2020, sorry, 2018 left beautiful infrastructures and it's lying there because uh, it has no sports use anymore, but it has many more uses. It can transform things and solve people's problem. One of the idea that we are talking uh, during the discussion that uh, why don't we try to bring tourism into it? Build the tourism so that people can come and enjoy their life. It's a beautiful place. And continue to take care of the beautiful infra infrastructures and so on. And for the benefit of the people. So you use the money to help the people who live there in the city of uh, Pyeongchang. And I'm sure many, there are many issues which needs to be paid attention to. We can do that uh, through that. And one of the ideas that we created uh, through our you know, uh, sports hub and uh, through our uh, centers and so on, uh, associated ourselves with the Olympic 2024 in Paris. Uh, so we are saying that the entire Olympic in 2024 should be designed as a social business. And the Paris uh, Olympic Committee has taken it as their policy. Now they are building everything uh, in this, in the direction of social business. Everything they do in the Olympic, the Olympic itself will be a social business Olympic. Here is a post-Olympic. The Olympic is done, but now what do we do with the inheritance with all the things that we have? Along with the, that, we have created the foundation, we have created the forum to continue the legacy that we built during the Olympic itself. So we have a big task ahead of us and we can enjoy doing that. And uh, be remembered that we not only had a f uh, one event which is historical, but that historical has generated many historical outcomes. That's the challenge we have. If we put our mind we, uh, with all our creativity, we can make it done. This is the challenge we have to face. And I'm sure with this collaboration, we can make it happen and show that peace is not just one event peace, it's a peace which the seed was uh, planted during the Olympic 2018, the seed of peace, North Korea, South Korea marching together, holding one flag. That was the seed. We planted it and we kept on nourishing that seed, kept on irrigating that seed and build up the giant tree of peace. And that's our task. So this is a next version, next edition of what we have done during the 2018. We carry it on 2021 to make it uh, grow and grow in various ways. We never can think right now, but we have some direction what we want to do. We want to make sure this 2018 experience 
doesn't fade away. It becomes a flame again, flame of peace that we want to continue with. That's the challenge you want to take and we can make it happen while we work together. I'm looking forward to working together with all of you and come back to Pyeongchang and have more elaborate discussions with you and looking forward to talking to government representatives who are involved with uh, new deals. This is an exciting idea for me and I'm sure you'll have many exciting things to do to those new deals, three new deals that you are planning to do. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much for allowing me to say a few words with you. I hope uh, uh, we will continue to work together. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your valuable opinions and experiences to the co-founder Eunice. And I'm very afraid of that this has come to the end of today's keynote session. But various sessions for Pyeongchang Peace Forum 2021 will be continued. Please give your interest and support. Thank you very much. 감사합니다.